Welcome to the Peep Show Podcast. Your glance at sex and social justice. With Jesse and PJ Sage. Welcome back to another episode of the Peep Show Podcast. We have a great episode for you. Sex worker, activist, producer, and director Liara Rue will be joining us. We talked to them about the activism they have done around internet freedom for sex workers, starting with their open letter to Patreon. And on a more personal note, we discussed their recent Motherboard article, Coming Out as a Sex Worker, Coming Out as a Person, and the impact it had on their personal life and career. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Peep Show podcast. Welcome. Before we jump in our interview today, we wanted to take a moment, since it's December, since the year's almost over, to reflect a little bit on the podcast. I can't believe the year's almost over. It has been one wild, crazy year. Yeah. <laughs> it can't even. certainly has. <laughs> Um, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of those things anyways. Yeah, okay. Some of the ones that are relevant to the podcast. But before that, I just want to say there's been some major news as well. Tumblr is going to ban adult content starting on December 17th. Yeah, and December 17th is the International Day to and violence against sex workers. So that seems pretty terrible, actually, to push sex workers off the platform on the day that's supposed to work to stop violence against them. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's not intentional, but it certainly adds insult to injury. Yeah, for sure. We've already seen a lot of sex workers saying that their content is being flagged. So a lot of that's happening preemptively. And it's a pretty big deal because Tumblr, in many ways, was originally one of the most friendly and inviting places, not only for sex work, but really for erotic art conversation and expression. And I think a lot of these communities, particularly queer communities, are really going to have a, a hard time now sharing the kind of content that they've historically shared on Tumblr. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... We are going to have at least one episode talking more directly about Tumblr later this month. Yeah, in two weeks. In two weeks. But it so happens that the interview that we have for you today with Liara Rue is actually quite relevant to this Tumblr news because Liara spearheaded a campaign to push back when... When Patreon did the same thing. (laughs) Yeah, when Patreon made a similar announcement earlier this year. And so we're going to talk about that and this Tumblr announcement as part of a pattern that we've seen on social media, leaving Twitter as the only mainstream social media platform that really is tolerant of adult content at this point, I think. Is that fair to say? Uh, It seems fair to say to me. So that's all I really wanted to mention about that. And like I said, we'll have a more in-depth discussion of this Tumblr announcement in two weeks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But I figured we should at least acknowledge the news since it's such a big deal in so many of our circles, not yeah, just our sex Yeah, and because circles. our episode, without us knowing when we recorded it, happens to be super relevant to what's going on. We're geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> geniuses of chance. <laughs> yeah, geniuses of chance. But yeah, so this year has been actually really exciting for the podcast. We're wrapping up the first full year that we've been a podcast. I mean, we started in 2017, but toward the end of 2017. So this year has been kind of amazing. We traveled a lot, actually. We went to AVN in January and did several special episodes from AVN. And I believe four. Four. We did four episodes. That's from... crazy. <laughs> that was an insane thing that we did as young <laughs> podcasters. It was. We had like a backup of so many interviews but yeah we met a ton of people and it was really amazing and it really did kind of kickstart our relationship to a lot of people in the community this podcast and it was the first time we ever tried to do field recordings i think as well 
Yeah, it was. And since then, we've learned so much. It's almost kind of embarrassing to go back and listen it is, to that. It is also really fun. I think it was really <laughs> yeah. cool. We got to talk to a lot of people on the floor of the expo. We did. And I mean, you're right. We would do it completely differently now. But it was fun. It was really neat to talk to people in the moment and like catch the energy of the moment of the event. Yeah, for sure. And that was the first big event that we went to. So it was interesting that it was the first event that we covered and it was also a huge thing and the biggest event for the industry. Do you remember how excited I was when we got our press passes for that? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You almost made fun of me. I was so excited. It was funny. You were like, we've made it. (laughs) Except we had only just started. We hadn't really made it, but... (laughs) No, Uh, but we like really felt a duty to very seriously cover it once we got our press passes. Yeah, and we did, and it was great. And then a couple weeks after that, we went to Austin, Texas to cover Body Hacks, a body hacking convention. And that was actually super interesting. Yeah. And what else did we do? We did the Blood Money event, and then we went up to New York for Hacking Hustling. Yeah, both of us were in New York. Yeah, so we got to travel a lot with the podcast and meet a lot of interesting people. And Also Theorizing the Web. Oh, and we did Theorizing the Web, too, which was also in New York. We went to New York three times this year for the podcast, but we like it up there, so it, it, you don't have to twist our arm too hard to get us to go to New York. <laughs> <laughs> and we also... Build a studio in our house so that we could have all of the podcasting gear set up full time. And that's made our lives a thousand times easier. And we've been able to interview some really extraordinary people. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually been the best part of having this podcast has been building relationships with people that I actually never thought we would get a chance to talk to. Yeah, you know, both of us are writers, and I really love writing, and it's the way that I'm most comfortable expressing myself, but there's something I really love about doing a podcast. When you do podcast interviews, you know, you're really creating a platform for somebody to talk in their own voice and to be heard in their own voice, and you get to share the actual interview experience with people, And when you write, your interviews are totally filtered and distilled down into usually just a few quotes, right? Yeah, that's totally true. And I mean, you try your best to like fairly represent somebody, but there's something about a podcast that's really humanizing and gives you like a much more whole perspective on the person you're interviewing and you really take the time and space for that. And and I love that about it. That's like my favorite thing is to yeah. be able to produce something where you really present somebody as a whole human being. It's so interesting because I've given a number of talks this year as well, like in my more academic career. And one of the things that I've been doing this year that I had never done in any of my speaking gigs before is pulling audio from our podcast to demonstrate things that I'm talking about when I'm talking about sex workers rights or I'm talking about sex work and motherhood or I'm talking about anything that I'm doing is pulling the voices of people who talk to us about the issues and who are affected by the issues that we've been talking about. And I've gotten so much feedback from audience members and people at conferences who've said that Hearing people's voices and experiencing them as whole people with their own perspectives and their own affect and their own stories totally changed the way that they thought about things. And it's really exciting to have access to that. And, you know, I think we're really grateful that people have been willing to participate. Yeah. I mean, I we take all of your stories very seriously, everyone who's participated in the podcast, and feel really grateful feel really grateful that people were willing to share their stories and their insights and their lives with us. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much work goes into that. Uh, (laughs) It's kind of like invisible, a lot of the editing and producing, but we put easy 20 hours of editing and production work into each episode. Oh, yeah, at least that much. And so it really is a labor of love. 
that's a good segue to talk about the fact that we appreciate all of the listener support that we've had. And we would also certainly appreciate it if that support turned into support on our patron. We're at patreon.com slash peep show podcast. We also would really love to go back to AVN where we kind of started. But we don't have the funds to do that right now. So we've set up a GoFundMe for that as well, um, which we have on all of our social media sites. Yep. And we would really appreciate any support that you could give us. We're about $325 into our campaign right now. We probably need somewhere around $1,000 to make the trip. So we're we're getting there. We're about a third of the way there. If you could throw us 5 bucks or 10 bucks because you listen to the show and you like it, we would totally appreciate that. Like we did last year, we'll definitely bring you lots of audio from the floor of the event and really give a ground level perspective on what it's like to experience this event and what it means for the people working it. Yeah. And I also want to say we are very, very open to suggestions and comments and questions. And we would love to hear from you. You can email us at peepshowcast at gmail.com. Reach out to us on any of our Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. We love hearing your guys's feedback and we love hearing your perspective. And you know, if you if there's certain topics or things or people that you want to see more of on the show, please feel free to reach out and tell us what those are. Why don't we uh, move on to our interview with Liara Rue? Yeah, let's get back to doing what we do. That sounds great. We are here today with Liara Rue, who is a sex worker, independent adult media producer and director, a political organizer focused on freedom of expression and adult workers online, and an advocate for decriminalization and protection of consensual adult activity, including queer and sex worker rights and safety worldwide. Liara is known for her interest in freedom of expression and expertise in online content creation, cryptocurrencies, virtual reality media, and for her various commercial and nonprofit projects. She has been been interviewed by or had projects featured by the press in publications such as Vice, Wired, Playboy, The Washington Post, BuzzFeed News, International Business Times, BBC Technology, and on blogs such as Reason, The Mary Sue, Kotaku, The Daily Dot, and Eros Blog. She's written as Liara for XBiz, Motherboard, Broadly, and Tits and Sass. So welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. We actually first came in contact with you when you wrote the open letter to Patreon and talked about it on the show, but that seems like forever ago. Yeah, it does. Jeez. I think that was when I first started to get more involved in sex work organizing. Before then, I had sort of tried to stay out of it. I think part of it was I didn't want my brand to get too political. People always will share tips on how to get more clients. And for some people, they say that clients don't want to see anything political. Of course, I've seen the opposite where as I have started to get more political, I've gotten clients who are really encouraging of that. I've only known you as somebody who's done a lot of political work. So that's interesting for me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, in my personal life, I've always been pretty political. And it's no surprise that it started to bleed into my professional life as well. And yeah, it, it seemed like with the, the open letter to Patreon, no one was really doing any sort of organizing around it. Like people were really upset, but I felt like there was a need to have an open letter just so that Patreon could see that, you know, not only sex workers were upset about this, but other people who use their site as well. For folks who maybe aren't aware of what's been going down with Patreon for the last year or so. Do you want to just give them like a brief overview of what that outrage was all about? Absolutely. So I think it was a few years ago that Patreon generated a lot of press saying that they were one of the few sites to allow sex workers to use mainstream credit card processing. And so After they did that round of publicity, obviously, even more sex workers started using the site. And, you know, these were very much explicitly porn. Yeah. (laughs) You know, porn accounts. I think the most notable one is Four Chambers, which has been on Patreon for or was on Patreon for a very long time. And it was pretty obvious what that was. 
and they were making at their peak somewhere upwards of thirty thousand dollars a month. So they <gasps> Whoa, they were of course really? <laughs> on on Patreon's radar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they did that, and then um, about a year ago, as you said, they started cracking down on sex workers. They started sending them messages saying, "Hey, your content is inappropriate for the site. We're going to have to ask you." to start censoring your account. And of course, people were extremely upset because <laughs> sex workers have been using it for years right. in a very obvious way to allow people to pay for porn. And it became obvious that this was as a, a result of increased pressure, both from payment processors and from the latest round of investments they had gotten where the investors wanted Patreon to appear more kid-friendly yeah. And this is unfortunately something you see a lot with new technology, especially on the internet. In this case, it's not necessarily new technology, but a new platform where initially they're very friendly to adult content creators because it gets more traffic to the site and expands their user base. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then as it expands and they no longer are as reliant on adult content creators, they start censoring them. And then eventually, usually just end up kicking them off entirely. Yeah. So I noticed that you aren't using it anymore. Did you go off of it because of all of this? Yeah. I mean, I was using it to allow people to pay for my porn. And, you know, Patreon did make it clear to me that they were fine with the fact that I was a sex worker. They just didn't want me engaging in any sort of sex work on their site. Okay. Um, so I could post like softcore photos, although of course it's always vague what exactly pornography is. Yeah, I thought that was one of the great things about your letter is that one of the things that you did was bring that to the fore that these sort of definitions are totally interpretive. Yeah, it feels so yeah. arbitrary so much of the time what gets pulled down or flagged on sites and what is allowed to stay. And it seems like more often than not, it's just that somebody has beef with another person or in an act of spite, like reports another person and has little to do with any consistency of the standards themselves. Yeah. Something interesting about the ambiguity of porn, a conversation that I had with one of the investors in Patreon, actually, um, this was at PatrickCon, which they, they invited me to right as they were starting to censor my account, which I found a a little... (laughs) Amusing, but yeah, I actually remember that. I brought up the Maplethorpe case, which I feel like is the sort of defining case about obscenity and what is art and what is porn. And I asked him, Where are especially queer narratives, mm-hmm. which are sexual, homosexuality, it's about sexuality, you know? right? Yeah, uh, where are these queer narratives going to go if they're not allowed on any of the like mainstream? Sites And he was like, there will always be someone willing to make a platform specifically for this. He's like, that's the beauty of the open internet. But what I think the issue is, is that, you know, a lot of the places that were formerly serving sex workers who often are queer, which I think is important to remember that a lot of sex workers are minorities in other ways. Right are now kicking sex workers off or, you know, talking about limiting sex workers, especially after SESTA FOSTA. We have to have companies that are mainstream enough to have the funding to be able to fight on our side. It's really frustrating. Yeah, and I should point out that this all happened before FOSTA-SESTA. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it may have been a preemptive response to FOSTA-SESTA, honestly, partially. Do you think that they Um, knew that that was coming? I think so. I think so. I mean, it Um, is true that the climate was shifting sort of discursively, like we saw over the past several years, just this explosion and trafficking rhetoric and framing all Mm. sex work as trafficking. So, which I think culminated in FOSTA SESTA. It is understandable that investors and other folks would be aware that there is this growing conversation around supposed trafficking, which I think all of us in the industry know is is really (laughs) vague and often overly expansive and inaccurate term in how it's applied um, so much of the time. Yeah. 
I found it interesting too how a lot of the people I spoke to at Patreon identified themselves as allies throughout the whole conflict. What did that mean to them? (laughs) What did it mean to be an ally? You know, if you want to be an ally, you have to stand with us. You can't just instantly cave to pressure. And I mean, I'm sure, you know, in their minds, they they put up some some sort of fight, but right. obviously it didn't accomplish anything. So. Right. And they don't have to put up the same fight. They're just like, well, despite the fact that this is these person's livelihoods, we have other people who can present their work and their stuff on the site. Yep. Well, and despite the fact that we've already got rich off these people. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. <laughs> and gotten a recognizable name and driven a lot of traffic to it. and Right. But now we think mm-hmm. we can make more money off of other people, so let's throw them under the bus. Yeah. You say that that open letter to Patreon was kind of the first move that you took to become more political, at least in your public persona. What sort of impact did that have on your professional life? Um, I think clients actually really appreciated me being openly political. I I mean, I'm sure I scared away a couple of people by being outspoken. But honestly, I I don't know. They're necessarily the type of person I would want to see anyway. Right. But yeah, people were overwhelmingly encouraging. A lot of people actually were like, hey, you know, I see all the work you're putting into this. I'm going to send you some money just like as a thank you for advocating for your fellow sex workers. And that, that was yeah, that's incredibly awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it also uh, just like got me a lot more plugged into the activist community among sex workers. So I, I started working when I was in San Francisco. And unfortunately, right as I started working, the SWAP uh, organization had just started kind of dying off. Um, One of the major leaders there had died and a lot of people were mourning. And so I had tried to get more involved, but it was just difficult. Yeah. So around the, like just a little, a few months after Survivors Against SESTA popped up um, and because I was more involved with people doing organizing related activities, um, I was able to get in touch with them and really, yeah, just meet more people who were doing really important and you know, just really amazing activist work. Yeah, I feel that because I feel like doing the podcast has given us access to that community too. And it's an amazing community with so many strong Mm -hmm. and interesting people. I feel like a sex worker activists are some of the most incredible people I know. Like they put so much of themselves into this work. Mm -hmm. Um, And Yeah, it just it's been a huge honor uh, to work alongside everyone. Yeah, it's unfortunate how things went with the Patreon campaign, but the work you did organizing was really incredible, and the way that galvanized into a movement. It's unfortunate that they weren't more responsive, but thanks for that effort because I I think that was really important. And yeah, unfortunately, that's one less platform we have. And despite the presumptions of those investors you were talking to, analogous platform really hasn't popped up for sex workers yet or for people who are doing more erotic content yet. And so I think we're we're suffering a little bit. Uh, It just seems like payment options keep dwindling away. Yeah. A lot of the work that you've been doing has been on digital rights for sex workers. And that's been a really big issue post FOSTA SESTA. Do you have an idea or projections of where you think sex workers are going to go? Or do you think that the scare is going to die down? Or what do you think is going to happen in terms of online platforms for sex workers? Um, So I think both the conservative Christians and the sex negative second wave feminists are both really gearing up to fight. You know, now that they've established, you know, even in person consensual sex work as being defined as like inherently trafficking, irrevocably damaging, et cetera. I think they're turning their eyes towards porn. Um, and you've already, yeah. you've already, I'm sure, started seeing the same language that was being used about full service sex workers now being used to describe porn performers. I think, especially that Rashida Jones, 
documentary, um, Hot Girls Wanted. They're really pushing to push this narrative that all people who work in porn are also trafficked. Right. And so, yeah, I, I'm obviously <laughs> really concerned about what that means because, you know, if they manage to get that through, that means sex workers probably won't be allowed on sites like Twitter or Tumblr, like other, yeah. other mainstream social media sites, which means we'll be able to get our voices out even less. Um, right. On the flip side, I do think FOSTA SESTA has really uh, gotten a lot of sex workers who were previously a little more politically apathetic or, like me, simply didn't know how to get in touch with people who were doing really important organizing work, really like galvanized that movement. And I think a lot of sex workers are really excited about fighting this new legislation. I think it really united people across different areas of sex work. I remember when I first joined Twitter, I think it was around uh, four or five years ago, porn performers were all in their own separate circles. Escorts, many weren't even yet using Twitter. And there were cam girls and doms. And yeah, everyone was sort of in their individual sex work silos. But I feel like now, um, you know, there's a real community, especially porn performers and, you know, strippers and doms who, you know, sometimes are criminalized, um, but often not in the same way right. uh, full service sex workers are really, you know, doing what they can to help full service sex workers do more advocacy work, which I think is so important because sex workers who are more privileged, either because they're able to charge more or, you know, because they're less criminalized, I think, you know, obviously no one's required to do any sort of advocacy work for the community. But I think if you have more bandwidth for it, for whatever, right. it's really important to support other people who are going to be the most effective by this legislation. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah, I thought that's a really interesting point about FOSTA SESTA bridging the divide between all these different forms of sex work. I got that sense too. Do you think that's because it affected everybody? I mean, even if it affected different sex workers in different ways, the fact that it impacted such a range of, of websites that there was some common cause in that? Or why do you think it helped to galvanize sex workers into a broader collective movement? I think there's a, a variety of uh, different reasons. Like you said, it affects almost every sex worker, um, whether they are advertising in-person sessions or not. The law was so broadly worded that people were worried it could affect, you know, porn performers' ability to post sexy pictures of themselves for fear it might be construed as advertising. Yeah, I feel like there, there have always been a bunch of very political sex workers, but I feel like a lot of them didn't necessarily have a specific cause to attach themselves to. Like there yeah. are more nebulous community aid things, which, you know, are extremely important, but they're often more localized and can be more difficult to hear about. And so having this huge national thing that people were really able to empathize with. And, you know, it, it even affected people internationally, too. It really brought people together. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking as you're talking, too, like, I yeah, I mean, part of it, I guess, is that it's like a national issue. And maybe also it has a lot to do with like the way that websites were reacting because of, like you said, the vagueness of the laws. It seems mm -hmm. like a lot of the websites have had super conservative reactions to FOSTA SESTA, wearing that any sort of adult content could possibly be advertising prostitution. Therefore, let's just ban all adult content yeah. as a way of ensuring that we're not liable for any sort of advertising for prostitution slipping through. The law revealed a lot about people's current views about technology companies as well, I think. Yeah. Facebook's very interesting support of FOSTA SESTA after the Russia thing. Yeah, I was just going to ask. I don't even think I realized what Facebook's stance on that was. Did they make public statements about FOSTA SESTA? Oh, uh, yeah, they were publicly in support of it. And I, I believe they also paid lobbyists to support it as well. Wow. Facebook, I think, was the only 
major tech company to come out in support of it, which I think was a very calculated move on their part. Yeah. I mean, I hate Facebook, but I didn't, I actually didn't know that, but this is another reason to hate Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like Facebook has always been the most sex negative of all uh, the major social media sites. Right. Yeah. And I should actually say as like somebody who has a public persona on platforms, I get harassed the worst on Facebook by dudes. Yeah. So it's not even just the company. It's also the people who are on it. The worst trolls, to me at least, are on Facebook. I am back on Facebook now just to like stay on top of events my friends are hosting. That's why I'm on it too. It's kind of difficult to do any sort of community work without being on Facebook. Yeah, but I I actually had deleted it for a year and it felt pretty great. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I hear you. I've had periods of time off of Facebook too and it was really nice. But, But yeah, I'm in the same sort of situation where I need to know what's going on in my community and that's where that information is. But it's also where people really heavily harass me and really heavily police women's bodies. And it's just kind Mm -hmm. of a mess Mm -hmm. on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, is also getting more aggressive, at least in that there are like automated algorithms now that are automatically pulling down posts the second you put them up. And I had my account and your suspended Facebook shut down and my too. Facebook shut yeah. down just the other day for a very subtle butt picture. Like it wasn't even like <laughs> com- <laughs> compared to most things, on, you know, on Instagram, <laughs> like entire accounts of butt models. But for whatever reason, <laughs> you know, the algorithm picked me up and and there's just nothing you can do. They, you know, there's no appeals process. Everything is so precarious too yeah. on those sites. Yeah. Like, Something I'm particularly frustrated about on Instagram is that it seems male photographers are able to get away with posting way more nudity than women models. Yeah, Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like I know several male photographers who, you know, on the regular post women's booty shots you know, and, you know, some of the, the one of the photographers that I'm thinking about, Corwin Prescott, like his stuff is really beautiful. But I look at the the pages of the models that he shoots and you'd think they would be posting these same pictures, but often uh, they aren't because if they do, their account gets shut down. And that's just sort of ridiculous. Yeah. 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 That double standard is really interesting. Is that It's like when the men artists do it, it's art. And when the women do it, it's porn or something you know, Mm -hmm. from the perspective of the platform. Or sex work. Yeah, or sex work or whatever. Or maybe it's not even about that. Maybe they can classify it all as like porn or sex work, but it's about who's profiting off of it. Yeah, it's true. I mean, that that's often ultimately what I think it does come down to. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, yeah, that when women or when femmes like start profiting off that stuff, that that's when everybody freaks out. Mm -hmm. most places where sex work is legalized but not decriminalized i think a lot of times what you do see is you know men owning brothels or whatever right um and taking a huge chunk of people's pay Mm -hmm. yeah which is what you know most of these sites are as well i mean the campsites (laughs) the you know the many vids the Night flirt. I think stuff. many vids might be owned by a woman, but uh, yeah, I mean Bella French is the CEO. I imagine there's a joint ownership there. Even when you have an industry person that's coming in and building a platform, a lot of times there's shadowy dudes that back them and that are reaping in some of the profits, just because that's how you know any of these businesses yeah. work. Somebody has to have the startup capital, right? Yep. Well, we wanted to talk to you about your motherboard piece that you wrote because I thought it was really beautiful. It was a really great article and um, and really brave. So we wanted to tell you first that we thought it was really brave. We had our classes read it when we talked about coming out in various ways. And they also like really positively responded to it. But not only did they positively respond to it, but they didn't know a lot about sex work. So They asked a lot of questions about sex work, actually, and it brought on a ton of really important conversations. 
Well, they didn't know what the word escort meant, right? No, they didn't know what that was. <laughs> Which is cool. I mean, at least they were honest. Yeah, they were like, this is really interesting. And this story is really interesting, but we don't even know what this is. So like, they're like, I think. Aw. Yeah. <laughs> Which is actually really interesting because I'm really up front about the fact that I work in the sex industry, but I don't talk that much about myself. So it was a weird sort of experience when they were like, what is happening here? <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, but it was also really great because a lot of my students actually wrote that they could really understand like the emotionality of all of this without necessarily understanding everything that was happening, which I think is important because I think that sort of narrative work that's done by sex workers humanizes sex work in a way that other things don't. Thanks. I really appreciate that. I feel like that story is especially special to me because even back in when I was very young, I had a a fascination with sex work. But one of my college professors taught a class about, you know, sex and gender and I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with it. It's this essay by Gail Rubin called The Traffic in Women. Oh, yeah. It's Uh a wonderful essay. She actually just visited our school last year or where we teach last year. Yeah, we went and saw her speak. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's she's super amazing. But yeah, my, my professor gave us that for reading. And yeah, we had a really amazing class discussion about it. And I feel like... Having that education about sex work in, you know, this formal setting really helped me become a sex worker without feeling as much shame. Mm -hmm. And we should say just for the listeners, if they haven't read Gail Rubin, the way she's using the word traffic isn't really (laughs) the way that we use trafficking today. It's kind of a very different meeting. And she's thinking much more broadly, uh, looking back in history and the different kinds of kinship relationships that women are involved with in keeping society together. And in fact, she's actually been a very outspoken advocate, both in protecting the rights of sex workers and practitioners of kink and BDSM. I I actually really appreciate the title because I feel like it's like a her trolling. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Annoying, annoying feminists. Um, (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, It was written in the seventies, right? Yeah. I love the idea of some, you know, really obnoxious feminists in the seventies, you know, seeing us, this paper and picking it up and like being really excited and then reading it and just getting, you know, Or or having their minds change, potentially. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that would be the best case scenario, right? It was definitely (laughs) like a big part of what launched the feminist sex wars. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to go back to what you said because I thought it was interesting. Was were the things that first attracted you to sex work kind of political or theoretical like that? Or how did you get interested in sex work? Um, One of my earliest memories, you know, thinking about sex work, I was, you know, really little in my, I I was raised in a very conservative Christian family. I just remember being in my bed and like thinking just about my life. I was like, God, you know, I was like, if I ever stop buying into this whole Christianity thing, I was like, I bet I'm going to devolve so quickly into like, you know, a sex worker doing a bunch of drugs. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> you know, you know, like. <laughs> um, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, I'm so close to going over that edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in high school, you know, I did decide that I, I was no longer aligned with Christianity. And I actually wrote a paper in high school that it was for my art class um, but it it did deal with sex work in it and how, you know, I I think I had some sort of simplistic ideas about empowerment back then. Like, I, I feel like I understand now that sex work is not universally empowering. Yeah. But I was really into the idea of, yeah, women objectifying themselves uh, to profit off of it. And um, I was obsessed with selfies at the time, too, and also this idea that, selfies being portrayed as narcissistic was like this, you know, attempt to prevent women from profiting either with social capital or capital capital 
off their own bodies. Yeah, there seems to be like a real connection there. That makes sense to me. There was so much negativity for so long about selfies. Now we just kind of accept them as like part of the fabric of society. But for like, Mm -hmm. for like 10 years, I feel like there was just so much negativity and it was clearly like misogynistic too. Oh yeah. It was so focused on like, young women and the duck face and just <laughs> I kind of forgot about the duck face. So much shit talking. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that. And it was a lot of anger about women posting things on the internet and getting attention. How dare they get attention on the internet? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's actually like that rhetoric in some ways is still around with all this thought audit bullshit oh like, god yeah it's, i mean but it's when you listen to those guys who are involved with it they're like these pickup artist guys and they're talking in very similar language they're like these women invading our spaces with their boob pics <laughs> you know like r- really frustrated that there are women on the internet with pictures getting attention you know i, I feel like that <laughs> anti-selfie sentiment has morphed but like it's the same basic misogyny that's driving the incels and these thought audit people and right you know whatever then the next thing's gonna be Mm -hmm. yeah so tell us a little bit about why you decided to write the article that i was talking about i decided to write it um because i just kept talking with my therapist about how i really wanted to come out to my mom Mm -hmm. Uh, and a few years ago um she had breast cancer. And I think around that time, especially I was like, oh, you know, like I really, you know, I want to talk with her about this because I I felt like it was such an important part of who I was. And I was just so I've been I've been really proud of the work that I've done. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. You know, not even just like the political stuff, just like the branding stuff. Like Mm -hmm. I love the photos that I've taken, all that. Like I'm really proud of it. Your videos are beautiful. Thanks. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, I had just tried multiple times meeting up with my mom in person. um, And every time I tried to talk about it, I would just like start tearing up and I was just like, all right, (laughs) I can't do this. So yeah, I I approached um, one of the editors at Motherboard and asked them if they would be interested in the piece. So I wrote it. And then as soon as it was published, I sent it to my mom. I saw Uh, that on Twitter. What was, (laughs) how did that go over? I mean, her response was lukewarm, which is kind of what I was expecting. I mean, it it wasn't bad. You know, she was like, I still love you. I wish you were taking a different path in life. But, you know, I'm not I'm not going to reject you for this, basically. Is her stance more of a like Christian conservative stance or a second wave feminist stance? Or why does she wish that it was a different path for you? I think it's a Christian conservative stance. I think she, you know, really wants me to be like a housewife who's married with kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Which you know is is not really um what my what my career looks like right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one of the things you did in the piece that I thought was really great is that you came out like on multiple levels. So you came out as a sex worker, but you also came out as somebody who's gender queer. Was it harder for her that you came out as a sex worker or what did she focus on? Um, honestly, my mom and I have never been super huge talkers. Um, so basically, she she said what I told you. Of course, I paraphrased. Uh, but she didn't really comment on any of the, the exact details of the piece. Uh, yeah. We, we haven't really talked about it in person. Most of my siblings now are calling me by uh, my new updated name. My mom still calls me by my legal name, which... I don't love it, but because she picked it out for me, I've decided to think of it as sort of a nickname. <laughs> yeah, that's, very that's actually really interesting. Yeah, I'm like, all right, you know, this is the name you've decided to give me. It's like an, it doesn't it doesn't make me feel super dysphoric. I'm just like, ugh, like <laughs> like baby name from because I, I associate it now with being so much younger. I'm like, oh god, like you know, yeah. I have heard this name in years oof yeah (laughs) yeah i mean that's really interesting you also use a very feminine name as your working name which is yet another name that you probably called a lot so is that difficult to go back and forth between so many names 
I feel like I only feel shitty when someone is treating me in sort of like a stereotyped girl way. They're like, oh, you're a girl, therefore you must want this or something. You know, yeah. it doesn't really matter like what pronouns someone calls me. I get a little annoyed if someone overly identifies me with being a woman just mm-hmm. because I, fe- I feel like that often feels like stereotype stuff to me. But I, I really love being more femme sometimes. And then other times, usually in my personal life, I am pretty masked. Like I'll ride up to the play party, with, you know, my hair tucked under like a baseball cap and like a massive strap on, you know, bold. <laughs> <laughs> Like <laughs> pretty much most of my Liara pictures, I think you know for a long time what I really liked about Liara was that it gave me a chance to sort of do drag as like this hot girl. And like before before I started sex work, you know, the only makeup I really knew how to do was like this crazy drag makeup. Like I had no idea how to do like, <laughs> like normal normal girl makeup at all. <laughs> That's so funny because I went to a photo shoot a couple weeks ago and it was like a body positive photo shoot. And I went with a friend of mine and did the makeup, but the makeup was done by somebody who does mostly drag makeup. So I had to like tone down all the makeup (laughs) because I don't do drag makeup. I do like more subtle makeup. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like learning to do this very subtle, refined, classy, like hot girl. It was a lot of fun, you know, and just like waltzing up, just putting on this complete character, especially in the early days. I feel like I've added more of myself to the Liara character that my clients meet. Mm -hmm. But especially in the beginning days, it was just such a like character was that kind of part of the fun of it yeah absolutely like just getting to be this ridiculous human being who like (laughs) you know i would be like very snobby they'd be like oh you know like i see you like caviar is this caviar okay and i'd be like oh no like that's (laughs) we have the 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 better caviar you know <laughs> yeah. Speaking of your clients, I listened to the Vice podcast that you did, I don't know, like a month ago or something with your client. And it was so lovely. The whole story was so nice. Yeah, Annalise, I I love her so much. She's, you know, really become like family to me. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the the nature of our relationship has evolved so much over time. You know, initially we were, you know, filling a lot more limited role in the other person's life. Yeah. And I guess I should say, like, before you start talking, because probably a lot of people haven't heard it, in the Vice podcast that you did, it was this interchange between you and a client of yours who talked a lot about how you coming out as genderqueer allowed her to also express that and her transformation and transition and your role in that. And it was really nice. I mean, there was all these scenes of you going shopping with her and helping her feminize in ways that made her feel more like herself. So this is a M to F trans person? She, I think she identifies as gender fluid. But Mm -hmm. yeah, she in... Most of her day-to-day life dresses in a very masculine way, and her body sort of corresponds with the type of body people would expect with that sort of presentation. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and you've you've been exploring more of the feminine side together. Yeah, yeah. Have you felt like you being more open about your gender identity has allowed clients to also be more open with you about that? I had multiple people actually email me and say hey, you know, I had no idea what this word genderqueer in your article meant. So I Googled it and I think I I might be genderqueer too. Um, (laughs) Oh, that's so neat. Yeah. So it's like, it's, I think 
you know, a huge part of helping other queer people, I think, is visibility. And I think especially giving Mm -hmm. words to those experiences, you have to be a very particular type of person for binary gender to be like an exact fit, you know, and all the stereotypes about that to feel good for you. And so I think for a lot of people, it's really freeing to be able to explore expressing their gender in different ways. I think this is actually one of the things that I really liked about your article is I think that if you're safe and if it's possible to come out as a sex worker or as genderqueer or as whatever your sexual orientation is or any number of things, that that can be such an amazing experience like for other people who then can have, you're right, like a language to talk about it, can feel not alone in the world. Right. Yeah, and I obviously don't think that everyone ought to come out because that's not good yeah, for some everyone. Yeah, people don't have the mm-hmm. resources or it's just not safe for one or another reason. Yeah, but for those who can, I feel like there's so much really amazing work that can be done just representationally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it, it even is healing or at least, I don't know, helpful in some way to see other people who are able to express that and and represent that and to kind of like you were saying earlier not feel alone in the world so there another kind of coming out that surfaced in the article is talking about coming out as married and i think that was really interesting it's something we deal with so we're kind of familiar with with be- with being married yeah well with being married in a yeah. public way while doing sex work yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, you're saying that's difficult for a number of reasons. And one of them is that there are really vague laws that can implicate people for living off of the proceeds of a sex worker's labor. Mm -hmm. Um, And that creates like a really precarious situation for the family or support network of a sex worker. The decision to keep my relationship for a long term private was, you know, sort of two pronged. I didn't want clients getting jealous. And I also didn't right. want my wife to get in trouble, legal or otherwise. Yeah. Um, it's it's really scary that people who want to be supportive partners are put in a super precarious and dangerous legal position, even for knowing that their their partner does sex work. Yeah, you were saying in the article, I mean, it could be something just as simple as driving someone to work or being their safety call or whatever. These things that actually in practice often help to protect and keep sex workers safe from harm are the things that are then used against their support people. It's suggested that those are in some way trafficking or pimping or profiting off of sex work. Yeah, yeah. I think it's something that really only serves to further isolate sex workers, you know, the fact that yeah, they have to worry about their partners being jailed potentially. Right. You know, I I have friends who've worried about telling their spouses or significant others um about their sex work for fear that, you know, the police could just even use that simple knowledge against them and like, you know, if someone's disabled and or like temporary unemployed, can't work right now for whatever reason, you know, if they like don't know where the money is coming from, that's one thing. But, you know, even just potentially being open about it could put that person in legal trouble. Yeah. And people have to worry about like children getting taken away from them. I, I don't have any children. But yeah, it's, but it's a real fear for people. Yeah. When I when I have thought about getting children, you know, I feel like I might want to prefer to adopt just for ethical reasons, but it's questionable whether someone would even allow me to adopt a child. Yeah, it just makes it really difficult for sex workers to be open with their their friends and family with what they do. Yeah, I found it's been interesting because it's kind of, since we run this podcast, it's kind of impossible for me not to be open about the fact that I have a partner and know not only that I have a husband, but exactly who that person is. And it's interesting because it, for me, like hasn't limited things, but it's totally shaped my interactions because I end up getting a lot of 
clients who are very interested in buy experiences or cuckold stuff or things related to couples. So even the people who are like just exclusively my clients still integrate my spouse into fantasy production or into lots of other things. And I think that's actually pretty interesting. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, after I started talking with people about how I was married, a lot of a lot of people started, you know, getting very interested. You know, their initial questions would assume that the person I was married to was a man, and I would correct mm-hmm. them, and they'd get, <laughs> you know, often very intrigued, and they'd be like, "Yeah, <laughs> they'd be like, oh, you know, does she, does she also, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> um, and I think having to explain to them. No, you know, like, she's not also a sex worker. Like, just me. You know, like, (laughs) we lesbians, you know, aren't just here for, you know, your your consumption. But, you know, thanks. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) One of the other things you brought up in the piece was that you deal with some chronic pain issues that has made it difficult to do some other kinds of maybe more conventional work. And that is a theme that I've heard a lot in talking to and interviewing sex workers. And it's another one of those things that sometimes can be really difficult to come out about. But you did talk about it in the article. And I just wanted to ask what role that played in like your decision to pursue this line of work and how you've managed that with your work and with your clients? Chronic pain has, you know, really limited my ability to do full-time work. And so one of the things that was really appealing about sex work was that I could set my own schedule. And, you know, I, if I had to, I could cancel things last minute without worrying about losing my entire job or, you know, take months off at a time if I was injured or something. It also gave me the income to be able to afford my treatments too, which, you know, especially yeah. in the United States, you know, I, I didn't have anything incredibly major. I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which basically means my joints are very wobbly and may dislocate at times. So I had to do physical therapy for that, which my insurance covered part of, but that was my <laughs> my wife's like tech insurance also too, so... <laughs> yeah. And I also had cluster headaches, which just took a really long time to diagnose. So that was a lot of specialist visits. Taking care of those health issues requires both time and money. And yeah, doing sex work seemed like the only the only real option for me to be able to try to heal. And I actually feel yeah. like now I've gotten to the point where I potentially could do an office job. I'm not sure I want to, but <laughs> I've done um, an office job. You probably don't want to. <laughs> You're like, maybe, maybe if it's like a really cool office where I don't have to work and like people just feed me things and give me massages. Oh, that them. would be nice. That yeah. <laughs> it's the right, you know. <laughs> I for if you sure find that office. don't want an office job. So, <laughs> yeah, that. The, sitting in a chair all day actually gave you really bad issues. Oh like, my god! You were I hated to, like, life really when I yeah. I thought it was really hard to sit for eight hours a day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you were also pregnant during that time. So well, not the whole time that I had an office job. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't advocate the office job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I what I have been thinking about is going back to school and getting like a. Uh, a master's in social work mm-hmm. because I feel like there's a, a dearth of mental health professionals who have personal experience doing sex work and thus are going to be better equipped to to help people. Yeah. And then That's to so sort true. of dip my toe in and see whether doing a just emotional labor job um, would be something I would like. So I, I've started offering life coaching. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and I've actually really enjoyed that. So I think that's really strengthened my desire to, you know, try to... I think I'll always do sex work in some form just because, honestly, I really love it. I I am ready now to, you know, do a job that requires more time day-to-day just because sex work really gave me the 
time, space, and money I needed to heal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so important. And I think those narratives about sex work are so important. Where can people find your work? I am on most social media sites, for example, Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit with the username Liara Roo. Uh, so on Twitter and Instagram, that's at Liara Roo. I have a bookings website available at liararoo.com. I have a erotic video, aka porn website at <laughs> .xxx. And for information about other times I've appeared in press, given interviews or written articles myself, you can visit aboutliara.com. And I also have a very cute sex comic at adventuresofliararu.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. It was really fun to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of the Peep Show podcast. I'm PJ Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at PJ Sage. And I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual or at jessiesage.com. We would like to remind you that we have a Patreon account and would appreciate your support. Please visit patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast. Our music is courtesy of Joe Kennedy. The show was produced by Jesse and PJ Sage. Signing off. Have a great week.